I want to look at the special case where you have a torque caused by a gravitational force, and I would call that gravitational torque. So what you need to know about that is that with any time we look at weight, at least an object's weight or the force of gravity, we're assuming that that acts at the center of mass for an object. So when you're looking at a torque caused by the weight or torque caused by the force of gravity, you need to draw the force at the center of mass. So for wheels or point masses, it would just be the center of the object. But for something like a rod, and let's assume it's a uniform rod, then the center of the mass would be in the center of the object. So same idea here. If you have a sphere or a wheel or something, and you have a torque caused by gravity, then it would have to be drawn from the center of the mass. And this is different than, say, um, a contact force. So if something is pulling the object down, then that's going to act right on where it's being touched. But for a long-range force, such as gravity, the torque is going to act at the center of the mass. So the steps for solving these types of problems, you need to identify the center of mass, and 99% of the time it will be in the center of the object. Draw the force at the center of the mass, and know that the radius is the distance from the center of mass to the pivot. So in other words, let's say we have a rod that's a length L, and this is the pivot point right here. The radius would equal L over 2. I'm going to do two examples just showing how gravitational torque would work in a problem. Um, if you feel comfortable after the first one, then as always, you don't need to watch the second. Okay, so in the caber toss, which is a contest of strength and skill that is part of Scottish games, contestants toss a heavy uniform pole, landing it on its end. A 5.9 meter tall pole with a mass of 79 kilograms has just landed on its end. It is tipped by 25 degrees from the vertical and is starting to rotate about the end that touches the ground. Determine the angular acceleration. So let's draw what's happening here. Here's the ground. We have the pole that has landed in the ground. And it's making a 25 degree angle with the vertical. So this is what we know. And it's just beginning to rotate. So it's just beginning to fall down. So if we list what we know, it tells us that the length of the pole, so I'm going to call that L, is 5.9 meters. Mass of the pole is 79 kilograms. And angle theta is 25 degrees. How do I know that angle is 25 degrees? I'll draw it a little bit bigger in one second. But given those things, what we're looking for is the angular acceleration, or alpha. Okay, so redrawing the diagram, the torque diagram. Here's the rod, or the pole. The center of gravity of the pole, we're going to assume it's uniform, is acting at the center of the pole. So this would be... FG. It tells us that the pole is making a 25 degree angle with the vertical, so this would be 25 degrees. Theta refers to the angle between the radius and the force. So this angle is the same as this angle. I think they're called alternate interior or something like that. I forget my geometry terms. So this angle right here would be 25 degrees. That's how I know theta. So we need to figure out what the torque is and then use Newton's second law for rotation, which means that we're also going to need to figure out what moment of inertia is. Let's start with torque. So torque equals FR sine theta, and the only force causing a torque on this pole is the weight or the force of gravity. So here's my pivot right here. Radius is the distance between the pivot and where the force acts. 
So the radius is going to equal the length of the pole divided by 2. So torque is going to equal my Fg, so this would be the mass times 9.8 times the length of the pole over 2 times the sine of the angle. So putting numbers in, we get 79 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram times 5.9 meters divided by 2 sine 25 degrees. This equals 965.21 keeps on going newton meters. So this is the only torque acting on the object, which means this would also be the net torque. Also, if we're looking at the way it's causing the rotation, it's causing the pole to rotate the way I drew my diagram this way, clockwise. So the torque would be negative. Okay, now we need to figure out the moment of inertia. This is a rod rotating about its endpoint. Moment of inertia for that shape is one third m l squared. So this equals one third times seventy nine kilograms times five point nine meters squared. And we're going to get 916.63 keeps on going kilogram meters squared. And again, I would always give you the formula. You don't have to memorize this. So now looking for angular acceleration, we know that net torque equals I alpha. Net torque over I equals alpha. So 965.2 keeps on going newton meters divided by 916.63 keeps on going kilograms equals alpha. And we'll get out of them 1.05, this is negative, keeps on going radians per second squared. And again, negative because this is getting faster in the clockwise direction. So my angular acceleration is about equal to negative 1.1 radians per second squared. Okay, I'll do one more example unless you felt okay with this one and we can stop here. Okay, a baseball bat has a mass of 0 0.82 kilograms and is 0 0.86 meters long. It's held vertically and then allowed to fall. We want to know what is the bat's angular acceleration when it has reached 20 degrees from the vertical. So very similar to the last problem, where you have a baseball bat, it's being held vertical, and then it's allowed to fall. So we're looking at this angle right here being 20 degrees. So listing my given information. The mass of the baseball bat is 0 0.82 kilograms. The length of the baseball bat is 0 0.86 meters. It's held vertically, allowed to fall. Theta is 20 degrees for the same reason it was 20 degrees in the last problem. And we are looking for, once again, angular acceleration. I'm going to solve this one with a little bit less numbers and see how things substitute in and cancel out, just so that you can see it is, is possible. So we know a cylinder or a rod being rotated about its end. Moment of inertia is one third m l squared. If I draw the torque diagram, here's the pivot weight is acting at the center of mass, I know that for the torque, it's going to equal the weight times the radius, which would be L over 2, 
times the sine of the angle. We also know that torque is equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So before I solve for anything, I want to substitute in some numbers. So torque, Fg is mg L over 2 sine theta equals the moment of inertia, 1 third m L squared times alpha. So all I did, I substituted this in here for torque and this in here for moment of inertia. Okay, so some things go away. My m's cancel. One of the L's goes away. So let's clean this up a little bit. We get g sine theta over 2 equals alpha L alpha over 3. So now isolating alpha, we get 3 halves g sine theta over L equals alpha. So putting in the numbers, we have 3 halves is 1.5 times 9.8 meters per second squared sine of 20 degrees divided by the length of the base load bat which was 0 0.86 meters equals alpha. And this equals 5.84, keeps on going, radians per second squared. And with one sig fig, angular acceleration is about 6 radians per second squared. And I messed up because this is actually, if we look at the picture, uh, this is causing a clockwise rotation. So this would be negative and the negative would have had to go in right here. So negative torque because it was going clockwise. If you drew the diagram the other way, it would have been counterclockwise and your answer would have been positive. So two ways to solve very similar problems. This way a lot more things canceled out. But had you solved it the same way as the previous problem, the numbers would have worked out exactly the same.